Hey everyone, welcome to the AFC podcast. Just as a reminder, you can watch our lovely faces on YouTube and also see the content that our day players are bringing to us. And Jim is modeling very beautifully. Wow. <laughs> yeah. um, if you feel like just listening or uh, popping in your earbuds, we are also available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and on CastBox. Uh, I'm Victoria Fragnito. I'm Jim Galizia. Thank you guys for tuning in. Today, we have a fun show in store for you guys. We're going to have our day player, Freddie G. Orlando, come on the show. He's going to talk to us about his film, his series, his pilot, which is kind of, it's kind of all of those things because it keeps adapting, called Belthood. Uh, we're going to check out the trailer for it, and we're also going to talk to him about his movie of choice, Back to the Future, which I love. Can, can we talk about how much? That, that movie is so quotable mm -hmm. like literally it opens up and i'm like that's a quote on a t-shirt somewhere like i don't think there's a line in the script that you can't put on a t-shirt yeah i i i'm literally thinking of like all the scenes that are popping into my head and i'm like there is a line in that that is so quotable all of it <laughs> doc you're one. telling me that we're back <laughs> i can't even remember the quote but i just remember the start of the quote uh it's such a fun movie a lot of the movies that we've done on the podcast so far are sad and depressing. It's more heavy, it's just heavy subject material. It's heavy. That's from Back to the Future. <laughs> you say it like it's just normal, but that's from Back to the Future. People started saying heavy after that movie, or they were already saying it, and they capitalized upon it and made it more of a thing. I would say that that's more like it. Cause that that was always a thing it wasn't a thing when i was growing up like i wasn't saying oh man that's heavy but i watched back to the future and i started saying it <laughs> that's when it happened mm -hmm. um yeah i mean i think that movie also helped skateboarding become cooler that might have been a thing because i don't think skateboarding was too big and in the 90s i think like tony hawk watched that movie and said all right <laughs> make this We're gonna ask him and find out <laughs> when we have tony hawk on the podcast unfortunately our reach doesn't quite extend to tony hawk just yet but we'll get there one day one day uh for now <laughs> we will we will have to go with freddie we'll talk to him about his projects uh but let's take a look at the trailer for adulthood and then we're going to talk to freddie about that and all his other projects going on when it comes to finding the one in a city of over eight and a half million, New York City is never short of options. So it's no shocker that when it comes to a mate, you're seeking a perfect 10. But is that always a good thing? Daddy, why couldn't I stay with you more? Well, you gotta go horseback riding with Jordan and Mommy tomorrow, remember? Oh, right. Jordan, how's it going, pal? Oh, it's going fine. Real fine, you know? Hey, babe. I just got off the train, and I'm gonna try and find one of these Uber cars to drop me off at Quint's. Hey, Scott, it's me. I don't think I'm coming to New York. Can you call me back? Living's are my favorite. Yeah. I know that about you, actually. Here you go. This one's on me. If you're only seeing one girl, and she's only seeing you, do you think there's a need to make it official? Hey, Colleen. I just promised myself that next time I got into a relationship, it would be with a perfect 10. As you get older and, you know, you get involved in relationships and stuff, you never lose sight of what you really want to do. You just, you just get older. Wise. Kind of deep, very deep. Unless I can smoke it, snort it, or suck it, I'm not interested. Oh! I'm the best for that. 
You think it could work out between two people the second time around? Yes, 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 yes. yes. Oh, <laughs> confidence is high. I repeat, confidence is high. That's for sure. A little too high. I guess the truth is, none of us have everything figured out. Or anything really for that. All right, guys, that was the trailer for Adulthood. We have Freddie G. Orlando here. He's going to tell us a little bit about that. Uh, Freddie, so tell us about Adulthood and what your role in it was. Yes, so Adulthood uh, was a television pilot that me and my buddies co-produced and acted in. Um, we started... Uh, Pre-pro, it was pretty much from where it's at now. It's evolved from being that television pilot three or four years ago to we're about to shoot a short form season, season one of adulthood, um, whenever everything kind of picks up again and all that good stuff. Um, so it started out about four years ago. My buddy Rob Alicia, uh, who's He's my buddy now. Now he's like a producing partner with me. He um he's a part of Leaving Normal Productions. So I work with him on producing things and and all that good stuff and acting. So four years ago, he he told me and my our other friend Scott, who co-produced it with us, he was just like, "Hey guys, I'm gonna write something for us." Because at the time, we were all just actors waiting for that next audition, and we weren't we what we weren't booking that next thing. So Rob, he has that talent and that gift of writing. And he was just like, you know what? I'm just going to write something for us, guys. It's going to be loosely based on us. So adulthood is pretty much kind of like a male version of Sex in the City meets Girls. It's like, you know, love, dating, relationships through the male perspective. Um, so we went with that concept. He wrote the pilot for us. And we knew going into it, we were going to produce it. Rob and Scott had um, experience producing in the past and this was kind of like my intro to producing for myself coming from being an actor um because I, I was i was hustling grinding and auditioning with acting for for years um until i met rob and scott a few years into my career and then i i went into producing adult with them and it was just a great experience you know we we did we pretty we you know we did everything as far as self-producing independently we we casted it we hired all crew, we scouted locations, um, scheduling, just everything you could think of. Our, our, our team made it happen and um, it got great uh, buzz and recognition after it debuted. We debuted um, in 2017 at the HBO New York Latino Film Festival in New York. And uh, in 2018, it really picked up some steam with uh, getting some awards and acknowledgement in, in the indie film uh, festival circuit. And last year, 2019, we were able to pitch it to a few networks and platforms in Los Angeles and New York through kind of like the connections and relationships we built through that whole, you know, run and, and circuit and whatnot. So where we're at now, um, we're looking to shoot our first season short form you know, six, 10 minute episodes, nice snackable content uh, moving forward. So that, that's where we're at now with the show. Cool. Have you given any thought to, I know Quibi is a new app. I haven't checked it out yet, but they're like a 10 minute episode app for TV type content. Yeah. Quibi's great. We actually, we met with Quibi. Um, we're going to circle back to them after we shoot the season. Very cool. Cool. Yeah. Interesting. A little, little random thought, just because you said six to ten minutes or something, and I was like, "Oh, that fits. That fits their format." Yeah, uh, and, and that's kind of where, like, you know, you're seeing now these platforms that are having these short, short form content. You're seeing more of them pop up now because that's just the way the world's going. That's just the way consumers and everybody is eating, eating up content. You know, they they say now in the era, the attention span's going this way and that way with social media and, and the internet and all that stuff, which is all goody. So now it creates a little bit of market for some more uh, snackable content and whatnot. And, Qu and Quibi's, uh, I've seen some of their, uh, some uh, what they were, what they got on their on their roster, and it looks good. Yeah, I haven't seen, but I have heard. 
from people that tried Quibi out and they were like, eh, it's all right. Yeah. You know? It's not for everybody. It's not for everybody. It's, it's got to be content has to be like either nice, quick, funny, but you know, you, you don't want to get too invested into something that's only seven minutes long. But if you have a whole season of a show, then it's worth checking out. So yeah. be interesting, whether it's on YouTube or Quibi, I want to see it. So whenever you guys are getting more closer to actually shooting it and you guys are based out of LA, is that correct? So I'm, I'm based out of LA. I'm, I'm actually back in New Jersey right now, just for a little bit. Um, I'm based out in Los Angeles. I moved out there like three years ago from, from New Jersey and my partners, Rob, Scott, Scarlett, uh, leaving normal productions. They're based in New York. Oh, okay. Yeah. So are you uh, part of the leaving normal productions team with them? Is that your production group or? So, so we're, we're, I pretty much, I'm kind of like, I, I, I wouldn't say, I, I, I guess I would say leaving normal products. I wouldn't say officially and, and, and what I can not contract it or whatever, but like I, I consider myself, yeah, I'm part, I'm part of the, the squad leaving normal and whatnot. Um, me, Rob, Scarlett, which is uh, Rob's girlfriend, um, our buddy Scott Rocco, and then we have Ev Evie Pitt Stoller, who's, um, who's, who's great. She's, she's a good integral part of the, the company as well. Nice. Well, how did you get started in the whole acting thing in the first place? Yeah, so growing up, I never knew I wanted to go into acting as a career, but I did enjoy performing for people. I was the class clown um, growing up. I did plays in elementary school. I did plays in middle school. And I did a play in high school senior year, Bye Bye Birdie. And that was the only play I did in high school. Um, I got focused more on just like sports and, and all that in high school. I, I didn't, I wasn't focused on theater, nor did I think that I'd make acting a career because no one around me made acting a career. There were there, you know, that, that just wasn't a field um, that I saw people around me get into. So I wasn't surrounded by it. Uh, but I did enjoy performing. And after that senior, senior year uh, high school play, I, I, I realized I enjoyed, I really enjoyed just, like I said, performing the rehearsal process. I really enjoyed all of that senior year. I think more looking back at it, I realized I, I, I enjoyed it way more now in hindsight, just looking back than I did in the moment. It was just something that I thought I had a knack for. And my art teacher at the time, senior year was the drama um, director of the program. And she was like, she knew I was a class clown because she dealt with me for like four years. Um, and she was like, Hey, I think you'd be good for this role and you should just come try out. And I was like, yeah, I did plays in middle school. I should might as well try out. And I did that. And that gave me kind of like the knowing that I could perform like on stage. And I did it in middle school, but high school is just a little bit different. It's definitely more, um, you, you take it more seriously and it's more discipline and you're, you're going to rehearsals after school for, for so many hours and, uh, leaving out of high school, I still didn't think I was going to go into acting. Um, I actually wanted to be an amateur boxer uh, in New York. Um, I was living in New Jersey. I grew up in Jersey, but I would always be in and out of the city because I had family there. And my uncle, who's from New York, um, was an amateur fighter. And he would he would we would kind of train together in the summer growing up. He would do mitts with me and all that good stuff. And coming out of high school, I knew college wasn't for me. I went to a term of like one term of community college and I just realized this isn't for me. It's not my thing. Um, maybe I go box. So I like trained for like two years uh, after high school to, uh, to become an amateur fighter. And I had one fight in the golden gloves. And um, the night before my second fight, I, I, I had my, my now 12 year old son, um, uh, Anthony and I didn't go to that second fight because I was just like you know what I just want to be here for my son um, I just want to be here for this moment and I and I didn't I really made the decision that I guess it didn't have the passion I had for boxing um, because it, it just didn't mean that much to me even though I was going for those two years 
four or five days a week driving from Jersey to New York to train, I just didn't have that passion and desire to keep going because right then and there, I knew I got, I had to step into fatherhood. I knew I had to take responsibility. And, and at 19, I had to just grow up and figure it out. Um, so from, so boxing was over and from like, I'm not good with years. I'm good with like my age. So like from 19 to 21, like I know people say years and I'm just like, I, I can't, once I get like, with you, on that. you know, like from like 2015, 2016, I could probably gauge the years, but everything that just like my age, um, for the next two years after that though, I, uh, I didn't know what I wanted to do in my, with my life. Um, I was just stepping into fatherhoods, being there for my son and there's my mom in the back right there. Mom stepping into the shot. It's all good. It's quarantine. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, for the next two years uh, of my life, I was, you know, stepping to fatherhood. I got some work. I, I was working with my father on the truck uh, for those two years. He owned the trucking company. And um, I was, I I'm not going to lie, even though I was happy I had my son, I was kind of just like a lot of things were coming at me. I had a lot of external pressures you know, stepping into fatherhood and figuring out what I'm going to do with my life. And then being on the truck, I didn't want to do that. So I, I, I really developed some anxiety. I got depressed a little bit. Um, and I had to make autopilot. Everybody, everybody hits that point where they're on autopilot and they're just going through it and they kind of keep catching themselves on autopilot. And they're like, what do I want to do? You have to figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I was literally on autopilot. And then I made that decision two years on my 21st birthday after that to give acting a shot because I figure this is something that I enjoy doing. This is something that I've enjoyed doing. And if I can make a living at this, at least I can give it a go at something that I, that I would want to do with my life and, and love and enjoy doing. So on my 21st birthday, I went to my first acting class and it's been, been history ever since. Very cool. What was, uh, yeah. what was about one of the first things you acted in? One of the first things I acted in was, let's see. Well, I started, I started off doing a lot of theater in New York and by, by a lot of theater on my resume, it doesn't, it doesn't look like that, but there was a play called slums of Neverland, which was a new play. And I did it at the uh, theater for the new city. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. I think it's like East ninth street or something like that. Uh, around, around that area. And that new play lasted a full year um, when I was first starting out uh, because we had like a, a one night scratch night in January. And if we had a good turnout for that one night, they might give us the summer run um, at the theater for the new city at the time. And we had a great one night. Um, a lot of people showed up and the people, uh, the creative directors of the theater, they were, they, they loved the story and they were just like, yeah, we'll give you the summer. So we literally did it in January and they gave us June to August. They gave us a whole run. Um, they gave us a nice set and, and we were in one of the theater spaces for the whole summer. But through that year, after that scratch night in January, we did like, we might've did like warm up shows at another, I think it was like stage left studio. Um, this was something... It, we're going back maybe, I don't know if it's still there, eight years now, maybe, maybe even longer than that. But it was, it was just in like a floor and it was a really small black, black, black box theater. And, it, you know, it was just like a floor with like this much space for you to perform on. And, and there were chairs and they're just like, you're just performing in uh, a space, which was all goody. That's what theater is. You know, that's what we love to do. That's, that's what it's all about. Um, so from April and May, we, we kind of had like these warm up shows at that, at stage left. And then we had that run from the whole, for the whole summer. And then we, we brought it back again after the run in like October, November, um, at one of the festivals, uh, play festivals in New York. Um, my, I forgot what, I, I forgot what it was, but that whole first, um, experience, even though it was like one show, like one play the the script developed over the course of a, of the year because the director at the time Dion Brown um who's still a buddy of mine to this day wrote also so he would change it so we kind of pretty much did this whole run for a full year and you know like I said when when I talk about this and I look back at it 
you know, the rehearsal process, all the hours that went into just rehearsing it and putting it up and discovering character, that was kind of like the forefront of me getting into acting, getting gigs and jobs. And that kind of laid the groundwork. And I did some theater in New York after that, but that like one year, that was pretty much when I first started. I was like one of my first gigs. So it kind of taught me a certain foundation and discipline that I really admired. Um, and still to this day, I, people ask, you know, theater or film, I'm a huge film buff. I want to be in films. I love movies my whole life. Theater, it just, it's just, I just, I just love theater so much. It's, um, it's just fulfilling. I, I really feel it's, um, it's the, it's the actor's medium and, uh, you know, my, we did Death of a Salesman last year in Los Angeles that I co-produced um, and played Biff Lohman in, our Arthur Miller's play, um, to commemorate the 70th anniversary. And our director said it best, if you want to get rich, you go on TV. If you want to get famous, you go in film. If you want to get good, you go in the theater. And uh, I stand by that, and I, and I just love the theater, you know. No, I, I completely agree. I, theater's my first love. And there's nothing quite like being able to like be in the room with an audience and going through this experience together. I, I still, I love film, you know, it, 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 but they are very different. It's really hard to, it's hard to compare the two because while it's still acting, they're, they're miles apart from yeah. each other in, in a lot of ways. Um, so now that you've kind of gotten the taste for producing your own content and creating your own content that's made for you. Do you have anything else kind of on the docket that you want to work on that you uh, want to put out there that's geared towards you or your, your group that you've got out there? Yeah. Yeah. I, th I think, you know, I, I tell, I tell um, actors that are starting out uh, to surround themselves with like-minded individuals and start creating. And I heard that myself when I first started out as well. Um, but it wasn't until I really stepped into that power to, to, to produce and create with my buddies. I didn't really experience what it was like just to create whatever you got, whatever you wanted with your friends. And after I, we put out adulthood, there was kind of no looking back because I'll still, obviously I'll still act in things. I mean, I'm an actor, actors act. So if there's friends that I, that I have projects they want me to be a part of, I'm all for it. Um, but it's just great because, you know, I, I wish I would have stepped into that role to produce a little bit sooner in my career so that I wasn't waiting for the phone to, to ring or, or get that email that I had an audition just so I could stay in a, in a constant state of producing and working just that, just creating some magic and stay in that energy, that, that mindset. Um, but now where we're at is aside from adulthood, the, the season, the short form that we're still fleshing out the outline, you know, as we move into pre-production, once everything starts going, getting back up again, we can really make some, some, some strides and start putting out the casting breakdown for the season and whatnot and start putting pieces together. I do have a, um, early 1960s, uh, piece. It's a love story. Um, about a, uh, a Spanish woman falling in love with a greaser. And um, it, it's something that I'm really excited about. I'm actually writing it. So it's my first step into writing because Rob, like, a, like a, Rob Alicia, he, he's been my mentor um, as, uh, you know, getting me into producing, but also now stepping into writing. He's a, he's a really talented writer, really, really talented. And he's just been mentoring me of kind of like, this is what we have to do. These are the beats you have to hit. He's been feeding me, you know, this past year of like what makes a good story, the, the structure, all this stuff. So this is this story. It's going to be called Oh Johnny. It's going to be my first step into writing, but also my first step into to, into directing as well. Yeah. So it's a it's a love story between two people, and you know, I just kind of it, it's it's nothing too crazy, but it just I love. I'm a sucker for, you know, I love dramas. Don't get me wrong, but but rom drums that's been my thing i mean once <laughs> i saw jack dawson in the titanic i mean i uh, you know 
along with the rest of the world and, and women, I, I was memorized by the, those two chemistry uh, on screen. Obviously, Leo and Kate Winslet, they're phenomenal talent. Um, but from them, you got... Last podcast, the movie of discussion was Titanic. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that, that's an all-time great. That's an all-time great across the board. Um, so, yeah, I really do like that, that genre. It really, it really holds... It, it, it hits to me in a certain way. It really speaks to me. Um, just as, you know, the power of love is, is very... I believe in just good energy and, and the power of love is just that very powerful that no matter what circumstances um, you, you could, you could conquer, you know, with love, anything. So with this Ojani piece, and even when you see in the Titanic, it's like these two people come together from different backgrounds. And even if their environment doesn't approve of their love for each other because of, you know, you know, race or, or whatever the case may be, they know what they have, no one else has. And that's, that's the truth right there. It's the love, it's the chemistry that they have with, um, together. And that's when you see great, I feel like great rom drums. you know, Star is Born, Titanic, Notebook. You know, you fall in love with these characters. You fall in love with, you know, obviously it's the story of these two, the chemistry on, on screen. You're watching these people really have a moment that's really like truthful and, and almost, um, really done well it's almost pure to a certain extent and that's where you really fall head over heels and no matter what like even in the titanic jack dawson coming from a lower class that didn't matter because love is love and and and, and i you know i believe in that so that's something that i want to i want to put out there with uh with the old johnny nice. piece well i'm excited to see how that develops over the the next uh year or so Thank i you. have to ask though as someone who is a, a theater lover um, what made, what was the decision for you to leave New York and go to LA? What, what prompted that? Honestly, uh, you know, a couple of elements. Um, when I, I'm about a decade into just going from my first acting class to where I'm at now. Um, and I haven't really started working pro professionally probably within the past five years, I'd say. And that's kind of when I started getting into producing as well. Um, but the theater, even though I, even though I love theater, um, I ultimately the end goal is to be in film. And when I first started out, I knew that I wanted to make a large splash in the industry. And honestly, I know it's just kind of just my spirit at you know, at the time when I made the jump three and a half years ago, there were a lot of external things happening. I mean, I was in a relationship at the time. My son at, at that time also was moving out of Jersey to another uh, location. So there was a lot of pieces moving that made the jump easier for me to go. But, but as I started hustling and grinding in New York and picking up steam, I kind of, in my head, heard how the industry operated in Los Angeles, kind of like, I just, like, just kind of seeing people's come ups, hearing stories. And what like my gut was telling me was my vision. Well, my vision originally was to be by coastal, but then what my gut was telling me was, well, listen, if you want to get into film and you want to make a big impact, you know, like, like you really want to make a, a huge splash in the entertainment industry, you got to go out West because of, um, and this is, this is not like what I'm saying is right. This is just my opinion of what's coming to me. So it's different for everybody else. It's different formulas and all that. But um, when I visited prior to moving Los Angeles a few times, I met with my buddy who's a, who's a working writer out there. And he knows like the way I operate in my mindset and, and putting myself in, in with, with the, putting the energy out and getting it back and all that good stuff. Surround yourself with the, with the right people, like-minded individuals. And he was like, dude, I know you're, you're all about that good stuff, but think of it this way. Being in LA, you are surrounding yourself with the energy of the industry. He just said that to me and it just like clicked. And that was like a year or two before I made the jump around that time. So once he, once he said that to me, it kind of made sense. It spoke to me. I can't really, I, I don't, I can't really explain it. But from that moment on, it just kind of felt like internally I was getting ready to make the move um, that my time in New York was done, that I, that I did what I had to do in New York. And 
I always said, if I listen, theater, like I said, my, the long term of it is being in film and producing, you know, great stories that I want to tell with my buddies and, 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 you know, act and take on characters and roles and all that stuff in film. Um, theater, I can do anywhere because I didn't, you know, in my head, I wasn't, uh, I'm not focused more on becoming on Broadway than I am a film actor. I think more, honestly, if I have to be honest, I, I really just want to be a part of film. Uh, I want to do it all. Don't get me wrong. But like that decision was just, right, I want to be in films. I know the industry is out there. I, I just started producing. I know a lot of people live out there because um, another, another uh, kind of story that I have with my buddy, Kevin McCorkle, who I did that to the salesman with, he made a joke where like, well, in New York, if you're on the subway, you could have, you know, there's like a writer and there's like a, a policeman and a Wall Street guy and maybe a lawyer and maybe a doctor. And then there's like a, an actor, you know, or then there might be a producer. But in LA, you walk around, you go into the restaurants, you go into wherever you're going, Mickey D's or in and out, whatever. That guy behind the counter is probably an actor or a writer or a musician or whatnot. The guy over in, you know, the restaurant's probably an actor, writer, and musician or whatnot. The guy that's everywhere you're going, you're surrounding yourself with it. And I know um, from what I hear, a lot of, you know, studios with people that work in the industry live there. So you're kind of getting absorbed in it and you're kind of, you know, surround yourself with it. And like I said, I felt like I could do theater anywhere. And that's what I, what I did two years being into LA. Like I said, last year, I co-produced and I acted in Death of a Salesman because I really feel like the uh, LA, especially the amount of actors that there are out there pursuing it. Theater should be booming in LA. I know there's no bra or, or anything, but, but there should be a lot uh, uh, a more uh, demand and appetite for great theater in LA because, you know, if people, can I curse on here? Yes. You <laughs> <laughs> if people give a shit about the craft, they'd want to like work on their craft and do it in theater. And, and I feel like that's the best training you could get. Like I mentioned before is doing it in the theater. Um, so it was just mainly, you know, it was, I wanted to make a big splash. I felt like if I made the move, I could surround myself with good people and, um, and meet people that are in the industry, you know, whether producer, writer or whatnot, just get myself absorbed internally as a human. I wanted to grow more. I felt like I was comfortable in, in New York, um, and complacent. I just wanted to get out there and be on my own and kind of just and grow as a human individual. And then um, and, and then also just like the film thing, you know, I wanted to eventually get into films and I'm not saying you can't get into films. My buddy, Kazi Togan is God bless him. He's been in New York all of his life. He's been in major motion pictures and all that. But I just felt internally that that's what was, was, was needed. It just, it was just my, some, my spirit was saying, you got to go out there. Your time here in New York's done. You got to grow. You got to, you got to deal with a bunch of shit. You got to evolve and, and just get yourself going out there. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And everybody, you know, has a different path and way that they're going to get where they have to go. Um, some people stay in New York the whole time. Some people hop back and forth. I know plenty of people who were in New York for a long time, left, came back, you know. So it's – everybody's path is different. And there actually is a ton of theater out in L.A. Um, as a playwright, I was looking at expanding out there. Um, okay. And there is so much theater because there are so many actors and they love the, the theater craft so much that when they're not, you know, doing the guest star roles on, on TV and when they're not, you know, auditioning for, for the major motion pictures, they're running their theater companies because they love it so much. Yeah. So I really, while New York does have, you know, a great art scene and you come here to learn medicine and, you know, the UN is here and fashion is here and they have everything. LA really is kind of a hot spot for all things acting, film, you know, yeah. theater, all of that. So I completely understand the choice to move out there. It makes, it makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, uh, like yeah. what you said, there's everybody over there is doing it. Like, uh, like Terry Crews always tells the story of how he was a security guard at one of the studios, I think at Paramount or whatever studio he was at. And someone walked up to him one day and was like, you are huge, you're gigantic, jacked. You wanna be in this movie? And then he was in it. And then that led to him being in Expendables. And then that led to Brooklyn Nine-Nine and America's Got Talent. Now he's everywhere. Terry Crews is all over the place. And there's- You just never know. Yeah, there's so many people with that know. similar story 
oh, I was in a burger joint and Ron Howard walked in. And now me and Ron Howard hang out all the time. And then, then you know, blah, 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 blah. You know, I've, I've heard those stories. I've seen them. And it's funny because, you know, you'll, um, I've, I've, I've been, I've had a story myself, my agent that, I'm, well, my commercial agent that I'm with now, um, she's a buddy of mine, but just from one of my side hustles, I, I, I promote at a lounge and I host a weekly mixer for artists at this lounge. And that ended up bringing in, you know, I've been doing it for a while before COVID and, and whatnot. And that started bringing in people that were casting directors and agents and managers. And it's just like, I ended up working with my agent who I'm cool with now, just because we were just hanging out. Just that was, I didn't even know she was an agent for like months. None of that. We just had, you know, hanging out, but that's just like, kind of like how I, how I, you know, how I see things. That's how it kind of works in LA, whether you're, you know, you're trying to get something out of it or you're not, you know, I think everything just happens for a reason. And that's kind of the way things move in LA. And I see it and I hear the stories a little more frequently, especially being out there. So it's just like, Oh, well, yeah, it makes, you know, it just makes sense. And, um, you know, so I'm not saying it's, it's uh, the move for everybody or, or whatnot, but it, it's, I'm, I'm glad I have made that move. It's, it's, I love it out there. All right. So Freddie, tell us a little bit about when we asked you what movie choice you wanted to talk about on the podcast, you said Goodfellas slash Back to the Future. Was Goodfellas your real first choice? I mean, we already talked about it on the podcast is why we said no to that one, but what was what was your first out of the two? Uh, it's uh it's a that's a tough one, man. They're both different films. I love both of them with equal heart. Um for different reasons. My, like for different you- reasons. Yeah, I would say my Goodfellas, my dad showed me when I was like uh, like ten, maybe, which I don't recommend parents showing their kids Goodfellas at ten. But I grew up in an Italian household, Scorsese. He, he was a big, my father was a big movie lover. And I got a lot of my, my film knowledge of watching like good cinema just from him. Because he would watch all the classics, always watch Turner Classic movies. So he introduced me to Scorsese and Quentin Tarantino at a very young age. Um, Goodfellas and Pulp Fiction, I think he introduced me around the same time. Uh, so my... My appetite for great film was, well, I, I, I became, I, I was intro to that at a very young age. So I became more of a film, film snob, which I'm really not, um, at a young age. And it kind of, him showing me Goodfellas from watching like when I was younger, like The Lion King and all these other Disney movies, which are great. And I still watch them to this day. But to, to see what like a really good, well-crafted film was, I kind of got that. At a, at a younger age. So I kind of like set what I would watch um, throughout the rest of my life till now. Uh, and Goodfellas was one of those films. And I, I mean, that's a film that I just watch every, at least a couple times a year, just to go back at it and just appreciate and admire the film um, and everything and Scorsese and all that good stuff and his, um, his decisions on how, on how he told that story through camera movement and editing, cutting, and um, just his own style. You get to see, just in general, as I got older, and like like I said, I want to step into filmmaking and directing in in the near future. Um, As I get older, I got, just to to kind of, I'm I'm watching film differently, just watching film differently. Um, Because every shot has an intention and has a purpose behind it. Really great director, like a Scorsese, I don't think he's throwing any arbitrary decisions in there. I don't think he's just in the editing room or he's on set and he's just like, oh yeah, we'll just use it. It's all right. It's fine. I mean, you know, I think there's, it's, it's very meticulous. And as I'm reading up on like great directors and their minds and how, how, how just like they, they command a set and talk to the actors and just get it done and get their vision, you know, shot. It's, it's very, it's all, I mean, it's just awesome. Yeah. And then how did that, how, how is Back to the Future your second choice after that? 
<laughs> honestly, it's it's watchability for me. So like, if I look back at what's the, what are the what's the most what's the film that I watch most in my life, it would probably be Back to the Future. Out of everything, I mean, Goodfellas. It's a totally different film and whatnot, and we're we're not gonna you know we'll swoop down on the rug. But Back to the Future, as far as watchability, I've watched that the most. Um, and the reason I watch that the most, because I just feel like it's a real, it's just a great complete film. Um, I think it has everything that I, you know, myself enjoy in a film. I think it's got a certain, uh, magical quality to it. There's a certain essence to it. I mean, I love the, maybe it's also like when it comes to style and music, I like the 50s and 60s as far as style and music it's concerned. Um, and just for them going back to 1955, uh, especially at a younger age, it just like felt good. And I don't even know, it just like hits me in a certain way. It's, it's got this magical, magical quality to it. It's got a great story. Um, it's got the hero's journey in a way with Marty McFly and getting uh, his parents to fall in love again or else like the whole entire universe. It's got deep uh, consequences or else the whole entire universe will explode or whatever it is. Um, it's got great life and death scenario. It just got everything. It's just a complete package. And Zemeckis, I think just really crafted a beautiful, magical film that I could appreciate every time I watch it. And yeah. it's like, I, I pick up little hidden Easter eggs every time that I watch it. And every time that I watch it is like a new experience. Cause there's always something that, that pops up and I was like, Oh wow, I've seen this movie a thousand times. And that's why he, he chose that Zemeckis or this makes a little bit more sense now. Um, and it just really, it just, it's just such a beautiful film. It's really, it's entertaining. It's got like everything. I think, in my opinion, like a great film um, should have. It's always a good time. You're like, you're, you're going through the journey with Marty McFly. Like, you're literally going through this journey with this kid and everything that he goes through. And it's, it, it, it just hits, it hits your, I think it hits your, it just hits you in a certain way whether it's spirit or unconscious, because it's got a lot of elements. It's got family, you know, it's got love. It's got um, just even him kind of getting his old man to kind of stand up for, um, for, for uh, stand up so he could kind of go through that whole thing with Biff and, you know, um, stand up for himself and, and kind of get her to, uh, I wouldn't say fall in love, but, you know, Stand, stand up against Biff and you know they, they get the first kiss and just get them together for the sake of if, the, if he doesn't then it's over the world's over or whatever and just for him getting his father to kind of be confident and make that you know that that stand to stand up it just makes it that much greater because even at the end that little like um shift in his lifestyle, Marty McFly, was all because of the journey that he went through and his, actually his father standing up and his mother even changes as well, you know, completely changes from the beginning to the end. So it's kind of like you got that happily ever after ending as well. Um, or did you? Because or did you? That movie is like, here's your happy ending. Psych, something's got to be done about your kids, Marty. <laughs> exactly exactly and you and you never know and then when you watch it like i watched it three days ago or uh and there after watching like youtube videos on like easter eggs and whatever of back to the future then you kind of wonder wait a minute as we're watching this is it the first time that it's happening or has this happened before and are we watching like the second or third or a hundredth time that this happened um and it's pretty interesting. And like little Easter egg, I just want to make a little shout out because I thought this was like very fascinating. Um, and, and I'm like a fan of Back to the Future. I'll go to like in California, I went to the old Pasadena house that they used to shoot, um, Doc Brown's house in the 50s. Um, that was super cool. They brought out the DeLorean and they put it in the driveway. So I'm like, I'll, I'll nerd out on Back to the Future all day. Uh, so when 
next time you watch it or anyone watch it that's watching this, if you look in the beginning of the intro with the credits when they're going into Doc Brown's um, laboratory and there's a bunch of clocks, my mom's like yelling in the back, loud Italian family. Um, <laughs> Uh, so if you watch it again and you see the clocks, there's this one clock that if you look, if you, and you could see it, there's this one clock that has a, a, a man hanging from one of the hands of the clock and it images and mirrors Doc Brown at the end of the movie. So I don't know. I don't know if, I mean, Zemeckis must have put it there as like a little hidden thing like oh this is gonna this is happening in the end um it's just like a little fun thing but that stuff gets me excited i don't know why but i think just like watching a movie from like if you've seen it a thousand times but then every time you watch these like other little things it's it's like you're watching from the first time again um so just a little 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 hidden easter egg right there yeah i'm sure well should- i was really excited that what was that? Sorry. Uh, no, I, I just said I was really excited that this film got, um, this film was chosen uh, for a while on Netflix. And they only had Back to the Future Part 3. And then they had a couple, like a month or so later, they had Back to the Future Part 2. I was just waiting for them to release Back to the Future Part 1. I mean, I have it, but still, it, you know, you just wait for it because it's such a complete story and such a complete trilogy yeah so they have two and three on netflix right now i think they finally have one they finally have one back they have all of them now but they started with only three why 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 would they do that i don't know that's mean (laughs) that is that is mean that that uh, come on netflix what's going on there right um their quarantine game up they need to know that we need fun movies yeah i mean that's come on Fun. And even the characters too. You got Marty, you got Doc, you got the mom, the dad. They got their own story. It's well fleshed out. It's um It's it's like Pringles because once you watch the first one, you just can't stop. You can't. Once you pop the fun doesn't stop. <laughs> it, it immediately bleeds into the next one where it's like it's your kids, Marty, and they have to go to the future. And you're like, what is up? And then the classic line of where we're going, we don't need. Roads. and the car flies people must have lost their shit back in the day when that movie came out dude when i first saw that when i was a kid i mean it's 2020 i'm still wait. i'm still waiting to see these flying cars hovering i thought this was gonna be that's another thing it was way ahead of its time in 1985 that movie was ahead of its time especially when it brought out the second one and he created a whole world um mm-hmm. For uh for the second one in the future, I I'm drawing a blank. I forgot the the year that he goes forward. Twenty fifteen, sixteen. Yeah, but he creates a whole world, and it's incredible. Even the fashion, it's just like then. And then we're going into the second one, but still, just like everything, it is really just really well, just really well done and executed, and just Let, rarely let's not even talk about Biff becoming president and looking like Donald Trump. I don't even want to go there. Come on, As they were they were. They were, they were projecting the future right there, right there with that. That's, mm-hmm. that's not cool. That's not some cool. Simpsons-level future prediction <laughs> stuff. <laughs> that's, that, was some cra- that was some crazy stuff right there. Well, Freddie, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for sharing with us your upcoming projects. We're going to share all your links and everything so people can keep in touch and see what you're doing and how adulthood pans out and all your yeah. other projects. But, and thank you for sharing Back to the Future, your, your point of view on that with us. Um, and again, just thanks for joining us today. No, thank you guys. It was, it was fun to chat with you guys. I'll do it again whenever. And I appreciate you guys for uh, having me on. So thank you. Thanks, Freddie. Thanks, guys. All right, guys. Thank you again to Freddie G. Orlando for coming on the show. We appreciate it. Uh, let's talk Back to the Future because I love this movie. It's great. How do you feel, too? I, I watched this movie, and though I was compelled to watch the next one and then the third one as well, I stopped myself. I held off because I was like, I want to talk about this movie on the podcast first as its own curtain open, curtain closed, singular unit film. 
because if I watch the other two, I feel like I'm going to formulate opinions upon those and drag that into a collected opinion about, I should be just talking about the first movie. Do you feel like that's tough when, like, because it's hard to watch movies like Avengers 3, you know, and not talk about Black Panther or anything else going on? Yeah, I, I, I think that does become a little difficult when it is part of such, like, an iconic trilogy. Like, you talk about Fellowship of the Ring for Lord of the Rings, you're going to end up talking about the rest of them because it's all part of a larger story. Or Star Wars, you know, you talk about A New Hope, you're going to eventually start talking about how that ties into, you know, the original trilogy, the the really horrible, or you know, one that came out later. You know, it's... <laughs> You, you have a hard time separating them. So it, it, it's going to be difficult to try and talk about just this one. But also this one film is so iconic and, and so well done. And just, so it's, it's such a perfect film. It's a great family film. It's a great um, fantasy almost film, you know, sci-fi and all of these cool things all kind of rolled up into one. Yeah. Uh, Back to the Future was released in July of 1985, which the movie takes place in 1985. So I I imagine people sitting in the theater and that was happening like in that time. It must have been mind blowing a little bit. Uh, Its budget was $19 million, which wasn't a lot. But back then it was it was a pretty penny. And the box office, it brought in 381.1 million dollars so quite a success i would say um it won the hugo award for best dramatic presentation the saturn award for best science fiction film and the academy award for best sound effects editing it received three academy award nominations five bafta nominations four golden globe nominations it won awards it's up there. It's also a part of the uh, AFI's 10 Top 10, designated the 10th best sci-fi action film, which is uh, pretty crazy. It's, um, you know, and of course it's followed by the two sequels that go directly. The first one almost bleeds into the second one because it's immediately like, here's this nice, cushy, happy ending. But wait, there's more. Yeah. (laughs) But wait. And uh, it's even spun off, besides the two sequels, it's spun off into an animated series. It's a theme park ride. There's theme parks all over the place that use Back to the Future for a bunch of stuff. There's video Mm -hmm. games, there's comic books, and even a stage musical. I didn't know about that one. I don't think it's completely finished. uh, It's not up and running yet. I think think it's Ah. still in development. Uh, But... It was ready to come to Broadway. I was here. We were hearing rumors of it coming to Broadway um, right before all the coronavirus stuff happened. I mean, and Broadway down. It, it's a classic in the pop culture. Like no matter what you think, like think about Rick and Morty. That show, the animated show Rick and Morty, is Doc Brown and Marty, Morty. <laughs> it's literally just a rip on those two characters and their weird dynamic. And it just made a whole separate show on that. Um, I mean, it it goes unexplained for three movies, for all those things. It goes unexplained why this 17, 18 year old kid, I don't know if they said how old he was in the movie, but he was supposed to be a teenager. You know, 28 year old Michael J. Fox was supposed to be a teenager. looks really young so that that's one of the few where you know there's always older people playing you know high school and college age kids and you know it doesn't like the cast of Mean Girls does not look like high school age kids but you know I, I, I can I can buy Michael J. Fox as a as a teenager at that point he was also in the middle of like shooting family ties at the time where he was playing that yeah age. that's actually an interesting story because he was immediately the film was written with the intention of Michael J. Fox playing Marty. And then he couldn't do it because of family ties. So they filmed a good portion of the movie with an actor named Eric Stoltz. And then they said, you know what, this guy's just not right. And they called Michael J. Fox and they worked it out and they figured out how to film 
the movie again on his schedule, which very glad that they did because it, I don't know if it would have been the classic that it turned out to be had they not done that. Yeah, I, I can't picture anyone else in that role at all. I think you can find some of the shots and the things that were shot with Eric Stoltz in the role. And it just, yeah, it, it doesn't feel right, even though it is so ingrained that Marty plays, or that Marty's played by Michael J. Fox. Even watching it, you're like, this doesn't feel right. Mm. You know? Um, I wonder how it felt for, for the other actors in the movie that had to be like, oh, we're going to do it again? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, I mean, if they enjoy the script, you know, it's a little frustrating to do it again, but if you enjoy it and then, you know, if you, if you feel like, okay, this wasn't right. And now you have the right person in the role, then it'll be like, ah, yes, this is better. I see why we're doing it. Uh -huh. makes yeah. That's maybe true. Um, well, obviously this movie, a lot of people know the plot already, but it's all about Marty McFly having this weird relationship, friendship with Christopher Lloyd's character, Dr. Emmett Brown, or Doc, as he keeps, is always referred to. Doc builds a time machine out of a DeLorean car, goes back in time, figures out how it works, and Marty accidentally, or sort of to escape nuclear terrorists, <laughs> like, and then Doc gets killed, goes back in time, gets stuck in 1955 because he's out of plutonium. Like, the plot to this movie cannot be described and you're like you're you're high you have to be high to watch this movie but it's it's such a crazy weird plot but it works cuz they don't pay attention to all the weird details they're just like it happened get over it and have fun because it's a fun movie i think that's one of my favorite uh john mulaney comedy bits is when he talks about how they pitched Back to the Future. Um, if you haven't seen that, look it up. It is hilarious because it's it really is kind of making fun of the big plot holes and things in the film because you know the film does have them. Um, but I vaguely you know, remember this with John Mulaney where he's like, "Okay, so there's a disgraced nuclear physicist." I just remember John Mulaney saying that. His best friend is a 17-year-old kid. <laughs> um, it makes no sense. But, uh, it, I do love, you know, how they, how much care in the details that they put in this film. Um, in, you know, when Marty does go back to 1955 while he's trying to outrun, you know, the, the terrorists. Um, and he knocks over the the pine trees at the farm that eventually becomes the mall and you get back to 1985 and it's not called Twin Pines anymore because he knocked over the one pine tree. Um, or at the end of the film when Doc does, no longer fuels his car with plutonium because of all of the drama that that caused and how it cost him his life in an alternate timeline. You know, it's now filled by garbage. Just garbage in the truck, it's all recyclable. And, uh, you know, at the time, too, in 1985, people were like, recycling? What is he using that stuff as biofuel? That makes no sense. This movie was ahead of its time. Yes. <laughs> Quite a we bit. Should have said. <laughs> we still don't do this. We still don't. Cause imagine taking garbage and being able to make fuel out of it. That'd be insane. That would be great, because we create so much garbage. <laughs> yep, we do. Um... So this, this movie is just, it's so fun. It's hard to describe in any way that isn't just saying that how fun it is. And even from a musical standpoint, like not, not as a musical per se, but yeah, musically, sport. there's so yeah. much great music in it. And I just love the scene where he's up, what, what's the band name? Is it Huey Lewis in the News? Well, you know, the band who does the Back in Time song? Yeah. Yeah, that's Huey Lewis in the news. Or no, wh but what's the band when he's at the play? Or not the play, the... Uh... Is that the dance? Yeah, the dance. Oh, I forget their name. Because uh -huh. he, he plays like, it's like Chuck Perry or something, where he gets on the phone with him, he's like, you want that new sound? Well, listen to this! <laughs> and... Yeah. Chuck, it's your cousin Marvin. Marvin Barry. 
Yeah. That was that was brilliant. Um, but and I I love the score to it too. The score to this film is so good. It's yeah. you know dramatic and fun. It has a little bit of that like sci-fi edge to it, and it sounds so triumphant. And it, it's just it was really well done the score. Who did the score for it, by the way? I do not recall. However, it's one of those, you know, musical scores that if you hear it, you know it immediately. Mm -hmm. Like, you okay, know what you know it comes from. It's very recognizable. Uh, I am looking it up. Let's see. Let's see. I mean, I know they obviously had Huey Lewis in the news for a long time. Alvin Silvestri, I think, is the motion picture soundtrack composer. Alvin Silvestri has done a lot of awesome stuff. So yes. it makes sense that he's a part of this awesome, awesome film. What else has yeah. he done? He did uh, Predator, Who Framed Roger Rabbit. He did obviously Back to the Future 2 and 3. Um, Father of the Bride, uh, The Bodyguard. He did Super Mario Brothers, Forrest Gump. He's done so many, so many awesome awesome scores for films yeah uh, i mean how good but these movies too it should be said back to the future came out in 1985 back to the future 2 came out 1989 four years later and then the third one not even a year later came out right after that in 1990. i wonder if did they like film both of them could they do something like that where they filmed they, both of them like they back to back? Have, because of all the time tra tra time travel jumping around how well it all works uh -huh. now clearly and it, it's it should be said too that time travel was like not too messed with at this point people didn't have the capability to like register this on film yet so back to the future was like the fun way of being like this is how time travel works and people from then on were like, cool, sci-fi, take it away. And then it went in all different directions. But Back to the Future basically implies that if you go back in time and you change something, butterfly effect, it ruins everything in the future or changes it for the better or for the worse, that there's one timeline and that's where we are. Now, other movies are starting to do things where there's alternate timelines and that's... Well, that's how they explained the whole Star Trek franchise that came out with Chris Pine and Zachary Quinto and Zoe Saldana was the whole reason for their timeline was, you know, a rift in the time continuum. And that's how they became where they are. And they, you know, they pulled, before Leonard Nimoy passed away, they pulled Leonard Nimoy in as the alternate version of Spock. Um, but actually, you know, I, one of my favorite moments in, the, in Back to the Future is when Marty finally shows up that night to uh, charge up the DeLorean uh, with the lightning. Um, and he's like, I can't believe it. You know, my dad stood up to Vith. He's never done that in his, in his entire life. And Doc immediately registers that that's going to have an effect on the rest of his uh, life. That's not good. That's he's like, good. never? He never <laughs> did that? Oh, well, we're we got to move on. You know, it's it's... Big credit to Christopher Lloyd because he could say so much with just the worried, crazed expression that he always had. He, he's such a talented guy. I loved, too, it, it wasn't that well done, but all the special effects makeup to look all the act, to make all the actors look older mm -hmm. because they, they were making people age, you know, 20 years, 30 years. And you can tell that these actors don't look like that, especially Marty's mom. It was just not believable makeup. And I'm sitting there and like, then you see her in present day in the 1950s and you're like, oh, she's cute. <laughs> like, you kind of like, oh, that's what she looks like. That makes more sense because she looked a little weird in the 1985 timeline. She looked better. And obviously they all looked better, but I think they did a better job with their makeup when um, Marty got 
back to the future, I think. Um, I think the makeup for the original timeline that Marty was in where, you know, she fell in love with her husband because of that whole Florence Nightingale syndrome um, instead of falling in love with him because he stood up and, you know, he, he stood up for her uh, kind of a thing. I think she didn't look as convincing as an older person then. What I, what I had a hard time with was Doc didn't look any different to me <laughs> from when he was in 1985. The only difference was the hair. His hair was whiter and more like, like frayed and frizzy as opposed to in 1955, it, you know, it was a little less gray um, and it was a little more tamed, but that's about it. The rest of it, he looked the exact same. <laughs> yeah. Doc is immortal. He lives forever. Uh, I forget how the third movie ends, but I'm pretty sure he's just like, I'm going to keep going on these time journeys, and he just takes off. Yeah, he stays back. He stays back in time. Does he? Okay. Because he fell in love with the, the woman in the West, in the Old West. Right. So he stays with yes. her. They do create a new vehicle out of a steam engine train. Um, but he stay he stays back in time. Yeah. Ridiculous. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> what a what a fun movie. I mean the musical score is such a good time. There's so much with this movie that like you could poke apart, but you don't want to. Because yeah. it's not meant to be like a serious sci fi, like not, don't take it too seriously. Just have fun with it. It's one of those movies where in filmmaking sometimes too you get caught up in the like it has to be artistic you have to do it a certain way you can tell that these guys when they were creating this movie they were just like let's just have fun and to this day it's proof that fun is the reason we go to the movies it is because you can go to a movie and be like i want to watch this sophisticated movie about about drama and all these things and i do a british accent when i'm trying to be fancy but it's uh, it's just it. It didn't take itself too seriously, and it was just a great time watching it. And I feel like you could put that movie on, and it's never not fun. It's always, it's always, it's even appropriate. Like it's almost like a Christmas movie. You can just throw it up, and it's fine. The whole family is on board. Yeah, that was definitely a uh, one film that got played a lot when I was a kid in the old VHS tape player on channel three, because that's the only channel that it worked on. VHS, what is that? <laughs> it's something that no longer exists and is very, very bad. <laughs> They're huge cartridges. <laughs> uh, I mean, VHS is so, they stopped making them, which is crazy because when are they gonna stop making DVDs is my question. I think that's a long time coming. Like it's gonna be years. I think we're probably closer to it than we think we are, uh, especially if I feel like coronavirus and the shutdown has definitely pushed things a lot more forward. Um, you know, like yeah, like the issues with uh, you know streaming versus them going to the movies and and all of that. Um, so if if there is a a death knell for the DVD disc. Um, I think it's definitely been pushed up due to all of this because there's so much more like people just get digital downloads of things and, um, you know, people have Blu-ray players can still play DVDs, but if you're going to buy something at this point, you're going to buy the disc, the Blu-ray disc, you know? Yeah. So I think, I think it's sooner than we, we think it is because it's still a disc. It's still, a, you know, but. Yeah, I mean, people love the collection of having, I know you have a massive DVD collection, or rather Nick does, um, but I mean, it's something of like, you want to be able to look over and see hundreds of movies on your wall, as opposed to having a hard drive with tons of movies on it, or just having a Netflix subscription, you know, you feel like you've collected less. Yeah, well, and, um, you know, with, with the DVDs, like I was saying when we watched um, Hot Fuzz with Isaac, um, Nick had that on DVD. So I just put it on, on DVD instead of, instead of streaming it. And they have 
so much more bonus content with the DVD. You have the director's commentary, you have, you know, the bloopers and the deleted scenes, and you have, you know, the, the little pieces that you don't get when you just stream it. So it, you know, I would love to see the Back to the Future DVD instead of watching it streaming wise to see all of that extra stuff. Like where does all of that extra stuff go then? You know, we didn't have that with VHS tapes. We only have that with the discs. And if the discs are kind of going by the wayside, I feel like we're losing a little bit of like yeah. that extra work that we got. I would imagine YouTube somewhere you could probably find pretty much anything. But uh, it should be also said, Back to the Future, the guy who created it, what was his name? Robert Zemeckis? Yes. They asked him about doing a reboot because this, so have you, you, do you know what a deep fake is? A, well, yeah, deep fake, isn't that where they kind of CGI your face onto something else? Okay. So someone took the clip when Doc and Marty go to the 1950s high school together to find his dad. They took that clip when they run into the mom at the locker or whatever, and they replaced Marty's face with Tom Holland. Mm. And they made Doc Robert Downey Jr. <laughs> Obviously because of Iron Man, Spider-Man, the chemistry that those two have, they were like, wouldn't it be funny if they did a Back to the Future remake, but with these two? And it was funny as shit. But the problem is that Robert, what's his name? Zemeckis? I can't pronounce Zemeckis. it. The problem. He has openly said, no one's going to reboot this movie as long as I live. To which he started receiving death threats because they want the movie. But it's dumb because I don't want them to reboot this movie either because it should be perfect. Not everything needs a reboot. It's so... I agree. Everybody thinks they need to reboot things all the time instead of coming up with original content or coming up with new stuff. I get it. You want to make money and you want to guarantee like, oh, if we put this out, we're, we guarantee that there is an audience for it. Like with redoing all of the Disney films in a live action version. Guess what? You don't actually need it. You need original ideas and you need to actually take the risk and try out some new writers and some new screenwriters and new stories instead of just rehashing the same old crap all the time. Back to the Future is perfect. Leave it alone, don't touch it. They tried to redo um, Dr. Doolittle or like the original Doolittle you know, story with Robert Downey Jr. and that flopped so hard. And it's like, yeah. why? None of, none of these reboots are getting like super rave reviews of like, it completely reinvented everything. They're all like, it was, it was good or it was terrible. Not yeah. like this was revolutionary. They need to stop doing it. Just I mean, some movies make, make a good choice to do a reboot and they're, they're good. And then there's some movies that do a continuation, a loose continuation, like Jumanji. I don't hate those movies. I wouldn't reboot the entire thing because you don't want to take away Robin Williams' whole performance and that whole movie was absolutely classic. But if you watch the newer Jumanji movies, they're funny as hell. They are a good time. So there, there's a time and a place for a reboot or a continuation or a resurgence or reimagining of a certain franchise. But Back to the Future is one of those rare ones that it doesn't feel like there's a way to do it. Even if you have such a great pair like Tom Holland and Robert Downey Jr., even if you put them together as this weird deep fake video goes, shout out to whoever made it, it just wouldn't feel right because there's no reason to. Right. Well, it's the same as like, you know, when they continued on with the Star Wars, the Skywalker saga, um, people, get so violently passionate over, you know, how much they don't like the new, the new trilogies that came out, whether it's, you know, the prequel trilogies with Anakin Skywalker or the new ones with um, Rey and uh, Poe and all of them. And it's because they want to recapture the magic of that original 
trilogy and you're just not going to do it. It's just not possible. You have to accept the fact that these movies are not that, they're not that. And if they remade Back to the Future or if they did a continuation where Doc Brown, you know, got stuck on his steam engine and, you know, came back to Marty in, you know, 2020, five years after Back to the Future 2 took place or whatever, it's just not going to be the same. It's not going to have the same magic and the same feeling. So you understand that you take that risk to that. Don't even start with me on Star Wars because that's a whole thing. I saw a video the other day that really put it into perspective where they were like, so you don't like the new Star Wars movies, but you like the old ones. I was like, no, I don't really like the old ones. I don't like, just so you, do you like the prequels? No, I don't really like the prequels. So do you like Star Wars? And you're like, no but I like parts of it. <laughs> it was like, I like the vibe I got when I watched Star Wars. That's the best thing you get. But they were like, I liked Han Solo's character up until this point. And then I didn't like this character, but Darth Vader was cool for here. And now it's like, ah, the Star Wars franchise was screwed forever, no matter, like from the beginning. And I love it, but it was never perfect. <laughs> It never had the potential to keep going, but they won't let it die. They need to let it die. Uh, I think. I think it's done now. Just let it go. Um, but, you know, that's what they, do that. they need to leave stuff like Back to the Future alone and just. Come or up they with will Star Wars it and ruin it over time. Exactly. Just, just let it lie. And you know what? If you, you're getting paid millions of dollars to make these movies and come up with stuff. How about you come up with something new? Cause that's what you get paid to do. You know what? Give me a back to the future video game where you get a DeLorean and you have to go back in time and stop disasters. And then when you do that, it messes up your timeline and you just spend the whole game trying to fix the timeline. That would be fun. Yeah. Video games provide a new outlet for certain movies that shouldn't exist or can't exist or whatever, do it. Do it. I'm, I'm all for more video games. That's, that's yeah, seriously. Always. Back to the Future, you heard it first. A story of Filmmakers Club podcast. You give us a call, we will make it work. We'll give you a story for it. Um, Something. It happened. <laughs> yeah. Well, this has been fun. Yes. <laughs> I've enjoyed talking about Back to the Future as much as anybody. Thank you guys so much for tuning in to the AFC podcast, for joining us. Friendly reminder, you can join us on YouTube to see our lovely faces and our Ghostbusters t-shirts. <laughs> and if you just feel like listening, you can listen on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or CastBox. And we'd like to thank uh, Freddie G. Orlando for joining us, for sharing with us the projects that he has coming down the pipeline. We'll share with you all the links and everything so you can keep up to date with that. And we want to thank him for suggesting Back to the Future. Uh, until next time, I'm Victoria Fragnito. I'm Jim Galizia. Thank you guys again for tuning in. Bye.